Excellencies, participants, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon from Jakarta and good morning to other colleagues or participants from different time zones. My name is Christina Pilia, Renewable Energy and Energy Efficiency Department at Asian Sorry, Center Christina, for Energy. I think uh, we couldn't hear you. Oh. Uh, am I audible? I can hear. Yes, yes. Can hear. Yeah. Oh, okay. I can hear. Clear. I can okay. hear you also. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Let me repeat again. Yeah. Excellencies, participants, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon from Jakarta and good morning to other colleagues or participants from different time zones. My name is Christina Prilia, Renewable Energy and Energy Efficiency Department at ASEAN Center for Energy. And I'll be your master of ceremony for today's event. We are delighted to welcome all of you to today's event of Roadmap Towards Sustainable and Energy Efficient Building and Space Cooling in ASEAN. The event is organized by International Energy Agency or IEA, ASEAN Secretariat, and ASEAN Center for Energy. Neuropath outlines sustainable measures for building and air conditioning in existing ASEAN to achieve its in energy intensity reduction target by 32% in 2025 and net zero energy in the building sector. Before we begin to the session, please allow me to share with you several housekeeping announcements. First, participants should ensure a convenient environment and reduce background noises, such as turn off the cell phone and etc. Participants should mute their microphone and only unmute if they wish to speak or present and is permitted by the organizer. Participants should only turn on their video camera when presenting or speaking during the discussion session as turning on the video may impact the quality of the connection and voice quality. This workshop will be recorded. We call it out for your understanding and concern in doing so. For discussion session, those who wish to ask may use the chat function in the Zoom. Only mute the microphone if you would like to speak during the discussion session. Excellencies, participants, ladies and gentlemen, we will proceed with the first welcoming remark from Mr. Nong Saret, Deputy Director General of Energy and Alternative Senior Official on Energy Leader, Ministry of Mines and Energy of Cambodia. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Okay. The time is yours. Okay, thank you, uh, MT. Uh, Dr. Nuki Anja Utama, Executive Director, Executive Director of AID, Mr. Randet Handam, Deputy Director General Department of Alter Alternative Energy Department and Agency Thailand as Energy Agency and Conservation Subsistence Coordinator, Excellency Mr. Well Nan Keris. Ambassador of Australian Mission to ASEAN, Mizi Nari Valik, Deputy Executive Director, International Agency, Energy Agency. Ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. Good afternoon. It is a great pleasure for me to welcome you all to this special event on ASEAN IEA workshop on launching and dissemination of the roadmap towards sustainable and energy efficiency building and cooling in Southeast Asia via uh, uh, visual platform. Today's workshop will focus on the launching of two important policy documents that the regional level, which is first, the roadmap of the energy efficient building and construction in ASEAN, and second, the roadmap towards sustainable and energy efficient span, uh, space cooling in ASEAN. This is the result of the collaboration between International Energy Agency, the ASEAN Secretariat, Energy Efficiency and Conservation Subsistence Network, and the ASEAN Center for Energy 
with the founding support for the ASEAN Australian Development Cooperation Program Phase 2 and also achieve APE Phase 2 Energy Efficiency and Conservation Outcome Best Strategy 3.1, which is to develop and disseminate sustainable energy efficient in building and cooling roadmap for ASEAN by successful uh, put, uh, publish this uh, material, we would like to express our heartfelt uh, gratitude to all relevant pan uh, partner and stakeholder, especially to international agents, energy agency. Ladies and gentlemen, to recall on the Benda Siri Begavan joint declaration of 39th ASEAN Minister on Energy Meeting, ASEAN and IIA express their steadfast con commitment to closer institutional relations and to working together to accelerate energy transition and strengthen energy resilient toward a sustainable and secure energy future for ASEAN. Therefore, we have collaborated extensively for this head on uh, regional and global energy prioritize. We strengthen them our collaboration to expand aspect all aspects of the energy system and it is a part of both side agenda which is on the energy efficiency program the two documents are complementing each other which are to ensure improve and monitor energy efficiency for residential and non-residential in the purpose of space calling in ASEAN we all await the investment on energy efficient and low carbon building is a cost effective way in reducing emission and the use of fossil fuel improve air quality and uh, provide many other benefits to household society and government however to attract more investment into this sector, reform in regulation and policy has to take into action in order to unlock this potential benefit for ASEAN. We also could prioritize the cross-cutting for energy efficiency action between economic, social, and environmental benefit. As a result, this will provide us, us with uh, which the concrete policy for the government to use this research for developing, adapting, and enforcing efficient, resilient, and low emission building. Governments could consider for implementation by 2025, 2030, and Belgium moving toward net zero carbon building. It enable and encourage government and private sector to work together and achieve this goal. I would like to take this opportunity to recognize the role played by IEA to ASEAN. I look forward to hearing the presentation from the finding and from our imminent speakers. I strongly believe that the vision we have will be transformed into concrete action and practical implementation in order to achieve energy efficiency and conservation key strategy as well as important the United Nations Sustainable Development Goal 7. Ladies and gentlemen, to conclude, I would like to once again 
thank all relevant stakeholders for their valuable presence, to thank the speaker for sharing the knowledge, study, and input. Highly appreciation to ASEAN Center for Energy for your tireless work in the pre preparation of this workshop and to International Energy Agency for your great agenda to ASEAN. We are looking forward to continue strengthening our cooperation in energy development for ASEAN reg regional following by our leader commitment. Thank you very much for your attention. Okay, thank you. Back to you. Thank you, Mr. Nong, for your excellent speech. For the next welcoming remarks, we are pleased to invite Mr. Wang Jet Panjuang, Deputy Director General, Deputative Development and FE of Thailand, as a EE and CSSN coordinator. Please join me to welcome Mr. Wang Jet. The, the time is yours. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Okay. Now, Mr. Nong Siret, the Deputy Director General of Energy and Alternative SOE Leader, Ministry of Mine and Energy of Cambodia. Uh, Mr. Viu Nan Kaviv, the Ambassador of an Australian Mission to ASEAN, ASEAN Australia Development Corporation Program. Ms. Mary Warwick, Deputy Executive Director of the International Energy Agency. And Dr. Nuki Akya Uttama, Executive Director of ASEAN Center for Energy. Distinguished ASEAN Member State. Good afternoon to you all from Thailand on behalf of Dr. Pasert Sinsuk Pasert, the Director General of the EDE. It's my great pleasure to deliver the welcoming remarks as EENC SSN coordinator for the launching event of roadmap toward sustainable and energy efficiency building and cooling in ASEAN today. First of all, I would like to thank Cambodia, the host country, and the International Energy Agency, ASEAN Secretariat, and ASEAN Center for Energy for organizing this virtual event of also thank Australian government for funding to strengthen partnership between Australian and ASEAN under ASEAN Australian Development Corporation Program Phase 2. Moreover, I would like to thank our ASEAN member and our related partner for stocky support and cooperation on this roadmap development. Ladies and gentlemen, we have completed one of our mission for launching of two roadmap today, which namely the roadmap toward sustainable and energy efficiency, space cooling in ASEAN, and the roadmap for energy efficiency building and construction in ASEAN, we are really how important of this project that we have been gained a lot of knowledge and best practice from the roadmap. Recommendation toward the sustainable and energy efficiency building and cooling best practice that can help us to develop our national energy efficiency policy and mission on building and cooling toward to energy efficiency and conservation target. Today, we are here together for congratulations for launching the roadmap and discussion the potential and opportunity for the roadmap adoption in Wales perspective from ASEAN member. I hope that finally it will serve our aspiration 
energy efficiency target of reducing energy intensity 32% by 2025 of under upper egg phase two. Finally, I'm pleasure to be with you all and wish you a very fruitful and successful meeting. Thank you and stay safe. Thank you, Mr. Ruang for your excellent speech. For the next welcoming remarks, I would like to invite His Excellency Will Dan Curtis, Ambassador of Australian Mission to ASEAN. His Excellency Will, please. Well, thanks very much, Christina, and it's really great to, to be here. Mr. Nong Saret, Deputy Director General of Energy, Ministry of Mines and Energy of Cambodia. Mr. Ruangdat Panduang, Deputy Director General, Department of Alternative Energy Development and Efficiency, Thailand. Dr. Nuki Agia Utama, Executive Director of the ASEAN Center for Energy. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. It's a real pleasure to join you here today for the launch of these two important policy documents. The Roadmap for Energy Efficient Buildings and Construction in ASEAN, and the Roadmap Towards Sustainable and Energy Efficient Space Cooling in ASEAN. In global efforts to address the challenges of climate change, energy efficiency is critical to reducing emissions and energy wastage, improving resilience to extreme weather and blackouts improving the comfort, health, and productivity of occupants, and lowering energy costs for households and businesses. Like our ASEAN neighbors, Australia recognizes the importance of energy efficiency. We see it as critical to achieving our goal of net zero carbon emissions by 2050. It's been estimated that Australia's emissions in our commercial and residential building sector could be reduced by nearly three quarters by 2030 by increasing the share of renewable energy in the grid and increasing electrification and energy efficiency. In 2018, Australian federal and state governments agreed a national plan that aims to achieve net zero ready commercial and residential buildings in Australia, the trajectory for low energy buildings. The trajectory identifies cost-effective opportunities for energy efficiency improvements throughout the building system for new and existing buildings. Australia's experience shows that the challenges to improving sustainability and energy efficiency can only be addressed through ongoing processes that take into account new developments, such as digital technologies like smart meters and thermostats, and requires a coordinated approach across various levels of government and close consultation with stakeholders, including industry, consumer, and academic bodies. Australia is a strong supporter of ASEAN's energy agenda, including through a feasibility study on ASEAN multilateral power trade and associated technical assistance. The roadmaps we're launching today can make an important contribution to ASEAN's sustainability and energy efficiency agenda, but only if the policy recommendations in them are implemented to drive real improvements in energy efficiency. And I think this is in line with the comments made by Mr. Nong Saret on implementation. Australia stands ready to work at the regional level with ASEAN bodies and the Secretariat and bilaterally to support ASEAN and its member states deliver real results for the people of the region. The forthcoming Australia for ASEAN Futures Initiative, which will underpin the new ASEAN Australia Comprehensive Strategic Partnership, includes a focus on energy security and will build on the support that's been mentioned under the ASEAN Australia Development Cooperation Program Phase 2 or AEDCP2. I encourage everyone participating in this forum to engage with the opportunities and challenges in improving energy efficiency in ASEAN. My thanks go to the Energy and Min Minerals Division in the ASEAN Secretariat, ASEAN's Energy Efficiency and Conservation Subset Sector Network, and of course the ASEAN Centre for Energy for their leadership of this important work and to the team from the International Energy Agency for sharing their technical expertise and experience. Congratulations again, 
Thanks for the opportunity to make some op opening remarks and I wish you success for the rest of this event. Thank you. Thank you very much, His Excellency Wilnan Kafri, for your excellent speech. Next, I would like to invite Ms. Mary Warlick, Deputy Executive Director from International Energy Agency. Ms. Mary, please, the time is yours. Well, thank you very much. And um, good morning from Paris, everyone. Um, good afternoon as well, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen. It really is a great honor to be speaking with you today to reflect um, on another critically important year in um, global energy and also an excellent year for IEA um, ASEAN co collaboration. 2022 has already been um, a year of momentous changes in global energy policy. Um, the impacts of the ongoing pandemic, Russia's invasion of Ukraine, and the pressing climate emergency means that um, now more than ever, we all need to come together as a global community to ensure a reliable, resilient, secure, and clean global energy system. Now, the future will always be uncertain, but we do know that governments and all sectors must move forward towards cleaner energy, and they must do it in a just and inclusive manner. International collaboration will be crucial. And I can promise you that the IEA will continue to be at the heart of this global effort, ready and willing to support ASEAN and its member states all along the way. Energy efficiency rewards action. And countries that have really pushed on energy efficiency over the last um, years and few decades now see lower consumer costs, lower fuel imports and lower emissions. But today the imperative to act even more quickly on energy efficiency has never been stronger. More efficient industrial equipment can improve competitiveness and protect jobs, while more efficient household appliances such as air conditioners and refrigeration and installing inst insulation can keep energy bills down for households while reducing stress on the grid as a whole. So I'm really pleased to be here today to um, join you in celebrating a collaborative project between the ASEAN member states and the IEA. Together, we have been working to develop two regional roadmaps. First, the roadmap towards sustainable and energy efficient space cooling in ASEAN, and second, a roadmap for energy efficient buildings and construction in ASEAN. And the roadmaps focus on the policy tools that are available for member states to drive energy efficient and low carbon improvements for the building sector and space cooling in the region. Following a policy package approach with a combination of regulation, information, and incentives, the roadmaps identify um, possible milestones, actions, and activities that governments could consider for implementation by 2025, 2030, and beyond to drive real progress toward net zero carbon buildings. The roadmaps also acknowledge that different member states have varying national circumstances, targets, and priorities in relation to energy efficiency. And each country will, of course, be configuring its own unique path and pace for improvements in the building sector. The roadmaps highlight a strong collaborative effort between the member states and the IEA. And we really want to thank all of you for your insights and contributions to these reports over the last year. We would especially like to thank the Energy Efficiency Conservation Subset Sector Network our project focal points, the ASEAN Secretariat, the ASEAN Center for Energy, a uh, full range of international exports, experts, and of course, our project funders, the ASEAN Australia Development Cooperation Program. These two roadmaps represent only the start of a journey towards energy efficient buildings and cooling, and ultimately net zero energy assist, uh, systems. We look forward to working uh, with each and every one of you going forward and wish you a very successful event today. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Ms. Mary, for your excellent speech. 
now we are move on. Uh, before move on to the next agenda, we will hold the group photo session. So please, for excellencies, you may turn on your camera and take a position. Time reminder, uh, now we will hold a group photo session. So please to all of the panelists and also our excellencies, please turn on your camera and take a position for group photo session. Thank you. Okay, shall we start? Okay, now I will count from three, three, Two, one. All right. One more time. Three, two, one. Okay, excellent. Thank you very much. Now we are moving to the next agenda for a keynote address on policy perspective and impact of the roadmap for ASEAN that will be delivered by Dr. Nuki Adia Utama, Executive Director of ASEAN Center for Energy. Dr. Nuki, the floor is yours. <laughs> Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Christina. Um, good morning, uh, Your Excellencies, and good afternoon, uh, colleagues and excellencies from uh, Southeast Asia and Australia. Uh, Christina, can I have my slide, please? Yeah, thank you. Before I start, again, I would like to uh, say um, congratulations for these uh, activities uh, done by uh, ACE and also ASEAN Secretariat. Uh, first, uh, Mr. Nong Saret, Deputy Director General, on behalf of the Your Excellency Heng Kunlin, the Director General of Energy and uh, Alternative Solidars, Ministry of Mines and Energy, Cambodia, as a host country. Mr. Wangdit Panduang, Deputy Director General, Department of Alternative Energy Development and Efficiency, Thailand, as the EENC SSN Coordinator. Also, Your Excellency, Wilnan Kerfis, the Ambassador of Australian Mission to ASEAN. And also, Ms. Marie Warlick, good morning, the Deputy Executive Director, International Energy Agency. On behalf of the ASEAN Center for Energy, I'm very pleased to welcome you today to the launch of the Roadmaps Towards Sustainable and Energy Efficiency Buildings and Cooling in Southeast Asia. I would like to thank all participants for taking time out of your busy schedules to take part in this launch event, where this workshop is a result of the efforts of the various ASEAN stakeholders, where we hope that we will be able to share with you Selling details of the roadmaps and hope that it can one day become the leading references document for ASEAN net zero ambitions. Ladies and gentlemen, the 38th ASEAN Ministers on Energy Meeting or AMEN hosted virtually by Vietnam in 2021 uh, last year endorsed two major deliverables. First is the endorsement of the ASEAN Plan of Action for Energy Cooperation. In short, we call it API, Phase 2, 2021-2025, serving as a blueprint for the long-term transformation of ASEAN's energy landscape towards a sustainable future. And secondly, the sixth ASEAN Energy Outlook, our flagship report, 
or in short, we call it AO6, also was endorsed uh, to complement the APAIC phase two. Those are helping to identify pathways and scenarios to pursue the efficient regional target. And it also endorsed a new regional targets, including in energy efficiency and conservation, and also, of course, the renewable energy sectors. For energy efficiency and conservation development, the new regional target is an energy intensity reduction target of 32% by 2025, based on the 2005 levels. As included in the APAIC phase two, among six other program areas, in order to achieve this target, APAIC phase two has identified five outcome-based strategies or OBS and programs. They are harmonized EE standards, participation of private sectors and financial institutions, sustainable buildings, EE and energy management system technology uptake in industrial sectors, and also energy efficiency in the transport sectors with fuel efficiency as well as electric vehicles. Having achieved an EI reduction or energy intensity reduction of more than 21% in 2018, which is surpassing 2020's target of 20%, the limitation of the <coughs> aforementioned OBS and programs can hopefully reduce energy intensity up to 32% by 2025. And also an ambitious scenario model in the six ASEAN Energy Outlook shows that this target is achievable with a projected EI reduction of 32.5% in 2025 and 49.8% further down to the road in 2040. Colleagues, Your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, the planned roadmap towards sustainable building and cooling are increasingly important with ice cells melting at an alarming rate Energy demand in buildings, especially in the commercial and industrial sectors, is notably growing. Despite the relatively low share in total final energy consumption, or the FEC, the commercial sector is expected to see the highest growth compared to the other sectors. If EENC efforts are not made, the commercial building will have the most notable demand growth, with CAGR of almost 5% or 4.8% to be exact. Similarly, the industry sector will also have a CAGR of 4.4% without EENC measures. In addition to building, cooling systems are also increasing in energy consumption. The data shows that the total energy consumption by cooling appliances will double from 2040 to 2040, uh, sorry, from 2020 to 2040, without energy efficiency and conservation measures or policies. <clears throat> Not surprising to all, energy use for space cooling is the fastest growing use of energy in building in the region. Electricity use for cooling in building across the region has increased dramatically over the past decades and will continue to increase today. Only 15% of households in Southeast Asia have an air conditioner. With raising incomes, we believe it will increase also drastically. It is anticipated that this growth could see electricity demand from space cooling in the region will reach 300 terawatt hour in 2040, which is approximately equivalent to the total electricity consumption of Indonesia and Singapore combined. We can see how big it is. And this fact on building and cooling shows that ENC are becoming very, very uh, crucial. Ladies and gentlemen, colleagues and uh, your excellencies, in response to the background, most of ASEAN member states have acknowledged the importance of EE by enacting EE laws, setting national EE target, and determining 
Energy Efficiency Action Plan. To aid this cause, the International Energy Agency and also ASEAN Center for Energy, and the ASEAN Secretariat, and the Energy Efficiency and Energy Conservation Subsector Network have established a joint collaboration, which is fun, funded by the AADCP2, which aim to develop a detailed roadmap for the buildings and construction sectors and a roadmap for space cooling in the region, as well as, well as to help reduce energy demand in the sectors and improve stakeholder collaboration. Hopefully, the roadmaps can act as a catalyst towards achieving ASEAN economic and community goals in the energy sectors. Ladies and gentlemen, your excellencies and colleagues, ACE is proud and happy to have been part of this pivotal roadmap development, which we hope will <clears throat> become a reference document to ASEAN member states as they face head on the challenges in the building and cooling sectors. Through extensive stakeholder engagement and feedback from the relevant member state officials, the roadmap are a culmination of a possible policy tools and target for member states to drive energy efficient improvement for building and space cooling. The roadmap, while non-binding or mandatory, could be used to spur local discussion and trigger support and action from the various stakeholders in each of the ASEAN member state countries. The roadmap, which provides options for the short, medium, and long-term goals, supports ASEAN strategy for energy efficiency and conservation, where the implementation of such goal will support the reduction of energy intensity by 20-20% in 2020, and of course, 32% in 2025 from 2005 levels. In addition, the roadmap support efforts to make building more sustainable and efficient. Find a possible approach to reduce energy consumption through policy measures and prioritize a list of recommendations for the ASEAN region to achieve the net zero carbon goals on building sectors. The net zero carbon goals discussion and ideas from the roadmap, which may seem to some an extremely ambitious agenda which could strongly catalyze capacity building as ASEAN member states appreciate the importance of energy efficiency improvements in the building and cooling sectors to help meet growing needs prior <clears throat> to help the growing needs prior to turning to renewable energy generation option. We believe that net zero goal is the most appropriate way to cut down energy consumption and grow innovation in building sectors. The roadmap show ASEAN member states with ambitious policies, incentive, incentivize and information system can be implemented in all member states and how they will contribute to the achievement of net zero goals. Overall, as conclusion, the roadmaps towards sustainable building, energy efficient space cooling in Southeast Asia, responding to the 38 AMM, to reduce ASEAN aggregate energy intensity by 32% in 2025 and promote clean, clean and renewable and also sustainable use of energy within ASEAN member states. And they also strongly support the widespread promotion of net zero goals, mass energy savings in building sectors. Lastly, again, that this roadmap are voluntarily and hence, please feel free to share your knowledge and provide your inputs to further elevate the roadmap and benefits, and benefits to all member state countries. Thank you very much for your kind attention. Stay safe and healthy. Back to you, Christina. Thank you very much, Dr. Rocky, for your excellent presentation. Now we are moving to the next presentation. Now we are moving to the next presentation on roadmap for energy efficient building and construction and the roadmap towards sustainable energy efficient space cooling that will be delivered by Dr. Senia Petrochenko, energy efficiency policy analyst from International Energy Agency. 
Dr. Senya, please. Thank you very much for, for the introduction. And uh, I'd like to welcome everyone to um, the presentation of, of the two roadmaps which we are launching today. And it's my pleasure to give you a, a snapshot of, uh, of their content. These are two very comprehensive documents which are available online and you have links in the chat. So if you haven't uh, had a chance to participate in the long journey of uh, providing your inputs from um, your countries to this roadmap, uh, please have a look uh, at our website and you will have access to full documents. I will give a, a quick overview of both of them and the key takeaways, but I would like to encourage everyone from the very beginning to think that this is not the end journey, this is only one of the milestones. And uh, after this, we really need to focus on the implementation uh, in each and every member states. And uh, IA will be happy to accompany and support countries in ASEAN uh, on, on this journey. Buildings play a key role uh, at the global scale uh, in uh, transitioning to, towards net zero carbon as outlined in flagship publication of IA from last year. We can see that a number of milestones along the way to uh, net zero by mid-century are related to buildings. We also estimate that uh, building floor area equivalent to the size of city of Paris is going to be added between now and mid-century weekly. And 80% of this floor area will come from emerging economies and developing countries. At the same time, in advanced economies, most of the uh, half of the building stock uh, present now will stay until mid-century. So actions on both new buildings and existing buildings, as well as electricity consuming systems, such as cooling, are extremely important for us to transition towards net zero carbon. And we estimate with ambitious policy and uh, project action, we will be able to cut, cut uh, emissions from this pathway from the building sector by 96% by 2050. As we heard from Dr. Nuki's presentation for ASEAN, building sector is also extremely important. important. Buildings are responsible for about 23% of total final energy consumption in the region and for 27% of related energy and process greenhouse gas emissions. Therefore, buildings are key for achieving regional goals on reducing energy intensity and increasing renewable share. At the same time, Urbanization, population, and economic growth are expected to drive energy consumption in buildings substantially. And without ambitious policy action, uh, we will not be able to mitigate this growth, which will result in substantial increase in greenhouse gas emissions. We also heard that cooling is one of the fastest growing end users. Here we see a chart for residential electricity consumption in Southeast Asia, and we see that Cooling and appliances are responsible, already responsible for the largest share of electricity consumption by household, and it is only expected to increase by 2040. At the same time, Southeast Asia is among one of the warmest and most humid uh, places in the world with a large number of cooling degree days, which places a lot of cooling needs by the population to maintain healthy and productive and uh, at the same time, we estimate by 2040, a large number of population, about 40% of region's population will still remain under heat stress due to lack of access uh, to cooling. The, as we also heard from Dr. Znuki, the um, presentation, the ownership of uh, air conditioners will increase exponentially uh, and reach about 60% uh, of population will own uh, air conditioner if no um, ambitious policy action is implemented right now by 2040. And uh, it will result in about two uh, air conditioning units per household on average. Indonesia is responsible for about half of this growth. Uh, and therefore, in all countries, the action related to improving energy efficiency of air conditioning and other cooling devices is extremely important. The good news is uh, energy efficiency can really help us to mitigate a lot of this growth. 
Uh, IEA has constructed two scenarios, which you can see on the screen. The stated policy scenario takes us on the pathway uh, if we are implementing current policies and targets, while sustainable development scenario shows us the, the trajectory which we can follow if we implement more ambitious clean energy policies in line with Paris Agreement, which will also allow us to achieve sustainable development goals. And we can see that from energy efficiency improvements in buildings and equipment, primarily cooling, we can achieve 110 terawatt hours of electricity saving by 2040. This is more than the current consum electricity consumption of Brunei Dar es Salaam, Lao PDR, Cambodia, and Vietnam combined. So these are substantial savings which we can achieve if we start acting now. At the same time, very importantly, um, efficiency in cooling and buildings can also help us to mitigate a large number of peak demand. Here you can see that um, cooling is responsible for about 10% of electricity peak demand in 2018. If we continue on the pathway we're at now, it will increase by about 30% by 2040, but we can almost halve this growth if we implement energy efficient policies for cooling and buildings. Having all this in mind, uh, as um, our previous speakers mentioned, IA collaborated with um, uh, ASEAN Center for Energy and ASEAN Secretariat and Energy Efficiency and Energy Conservation Subsector Network to develop these two roadmaps to provide guidance for policymakers in the regions on policy developer development and identification of actions, which can help us to stay on more sustainable pathway towards uh, future buildings and cooling sectors. These roadmaps intend as a supporting strategy documents, and as we heard, they're not uh, mandatory or obligatory, um, but we really encourage member states to, to use them in their policy development because they are providing milestones and looking at current state of play um, uh, to identify actions which can be taken in short term, mid term, and long term with a vision to transition towards net zero carbon. There are several fundamental principles um, which we base these roadmaps on. We acknowledge that different member states have different conditions, priorities, and interests when it comes to uh, clean energy. Therefore, road doesn't mean that uh, each member state has to implement all of those um, ingredients. So they are very adaptable to the conditions of each member state, and we are happy to support and provide uh, advice on how it can be done. Also, we are going to discuss the implementation process in the, in the panel. So if you have any questions uh, regarding how it can be done in your country, you're very welcome to, to join the discussion. Another important principle is holistic approach. So we are looking at both building and space cooling areas from integrated point of view, acknowledging their complexity, fragmentation, uh, a number of stakeholders are involved in the decision-making process, and so on and so forth. It is very important to uh, design future policy uh, decisions, looking at the current uh, and existing instruments. So uh, taking into account strategic planning and integrating the any, any new and uh, um, any new actions into the current uh, policy processes. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, the last principle is very important is the multi-stakeholder collaboration. As I mentioned, many stakeholders are involved in the building sector and, uh, and the cooling uh, sectors. So it's important that from the very beginning of implementation of process, different stakeholders are on board and their interests are taken into account also acknowledging that there are different levels of governance in different member states. So passing the instructions and guidance to subnational, from national level to subnational and local governments are extremely important to make sure that implementation is following the same approach. Also acknowledging that um, multiple benefits are um, very important for other areas of policymaking and there are many benefits which come together with uh, 
uh, energy savings and greenhouse gas emissions reductions from energy efficiency improvements in buildings. So in both roadmaps, we will look at them in more detail, and they're very important to be integrated into uh, policy development and the policy narrative. Um, Mary mentioned the, that we um, integrate policy package approach in our uh, roadmaps. In both roadmaps, you will find um, a, a lot of information about specific policy instruments, and we advocate that there is no one silver bullet which can solve energy efficiency barriers to energy efficiency for buildings and cooling. So we look at instruments from a combination of regulatory mechanisms, information tools, and incentives. Regulatory instruments are extremely important as a starting point to give the push to the market to make sure that we are transitioning the whole market towards more efficient buildings and products. Information support this um, the regulatory instrument and in providing the lift of the market towards high levels of energy efficiency, influencing consumer choices in favor of more efficient um, solutions. And incentives pull markets even further beyond um, energy efficient, uh, minimum energy efficient uh, requirements to, to encourage innovation, to encourage further development uh, and uh, ambition. So all these three components are extremely important and we will see in the next slides uh, how we approach them in both roadmaps. As I mentioned, the, the process of identifying milestones and actions starts with um, looking at the current state uh, of play, current state of uh, policy development in, um, in all countries. Here we only have a, a quick snapshot of key policy instruments for uh, uh, regulation in buildings and minimum energy performance standards for appliances. So as you can see, different countries uh, have uh, different status in terms of the adoption and implementation of these regular instruments. But across the region, we can see that there is a trend of implementing energy efficiency uh, policies. Uh, we, in, the, in our roadmaps, you will see that we are encouraging countries to expand the scope, both of building codes and uh, um, minimum energy performance standards to include uh, more building types, to include more appliances, covering fans, for example, uh, are very important by minimum energy performance standards. You can see that only a few countries have them in place. And certification and labeling are extremely important information instruments to do this lift of the market, as I mentioned before. At the moment for buildings, they're mainly voluntary. So uh, strengthening those instruments and uh, making disclosure of energy performance uh, of buildings are also key to provide information and data for consumers. Looking uh, more into the roadmaps, um, the structure of roadmaps is slightly different. Buildings roadmap is structured around seven action areas, which you can see on the chart. As we know, building sector is very complex. So we diving into each of this area and uh, looking at the current status, uh, at the milestones, uh, stakeholder mapping, as well as uh, providing potential actions, uh, activities, uh, and uh, high-level indicators for each of them. So this is just a, a sneak peek how one of the uh, action areas is structured. So these are new buildings. So we have a high-level milestone uh, milestones for uh, new buildings and uh, the vision towards net zero carbon. They are, uh, this vision is translated into specific actions, uh, which you can see in the columns and activities, which help to achieve each of these actions. This is more detailed view. So for each activity, we look at current status and the uh, milestones for 2025, 2030 and uh, net zero carbon. Very importantly, we also look at um, in different stakeholder groups and their roles for implementation of each of the activities to provide some guidance on what stakeholders should be on board in order to implement each of these actions. Again, this is just an illustration example for new buildings. The darker or the brighter the color, the more important the stakeholder group is for each of the activities. And you have this information for each of uh, the seven action areas and each um, activity in the program. 
one of the key aspects uh, of the roadmap and the, the sort of the result of the roadmap is a um, proposed policy package or what kind of policy instruments can be included and configured for each of the member states. Uh, in This is just a very summary uh, version of the key uh, instruments uh, for buildings. You, you have a much longer and detailed version in the roadmap, but we're starting with the, with the regulation. So here, of course, building codes, um, product standards, procurement regulations, and also regulation on low carbon materials are very important. Uh, supported by information instruments such as certification, labeling, disclosure, of course, capacity building are key to make sure we have sufficient skill set and uh, both financial and non-financial incentives to ensure the compliance and encourage the market to, to go beyond the regulation as well. There is also policy package for space cooling. Actually, the, the roadmap for uh, space cooling is structured around um, the policy policy packages, policy package and different policy instruments. We look at 12 types of policy measures and uh, analyze current status for each of them, uh, provide milestone and near-term actions, as well as some examples and case studies for best practices. One of the very important aspects for, for regulation uh, uh, from um, for, for regulation development within the cooling um, roadmap is the letter approach, as we're suggesting to use the, the strategic vision for long-term uh, targets when it comes to minimum energy performance standards to ensure that they evolve in time and the, the stringency of the, of the uh, standards is increasing. So here we just have an illustrative um, example how it can uh, look like. Uh, as you can see, with time, the, the efficiency requirement of minimum energy performance standard is increasing, but also the efficiency of uh, different um, classes of labeling is increasing. And if it is uh, made publicly available for um, different stakeholders, for industry, they uh, can anticipate how regulation will change in time and adapt their strategies already now uh, to, to move towards more efficient uh, products. So coming to the end of the presentation, there are key um, recommendations which, um, which you can find in the, in the roadmap. Uh, it's hard to summarize them in one slide, but the, the recommendations follow the policy package approach. So we start with adopting and strengthening uh, regulatory instruments for buildings. It's of course building energy codes which um, should progressively update with time to include as many building types as possible, include existing buildings as well. For um, appliances, this is minimum energy performance standards for both air conditioners and fans. Fans are extremely important. Uh, as you know, um, the ownership of air conditioners is still limited. So a lot of people are using fans as their primary cooling appliance for thermal comfort. And the latter approach, which is um, talked about, should be applied to increase their stringency with time, with harmonized testing procedures and uh, monitoring ver verification and evaluation procedures. Certification and labeling, we already spoke about, they're both uh, very important for both buildings and appliances. And of course, capacity building uh, across different um, skill sets and different stakeholder groups to make sure we have um, a sufficient, uh, professional, sufficient amount of professionals to execute the energy efficiency improvements, both in buildings uh, and appliances and maintenance work as well. Um, another important aspect is data. Data is uh, still lacking both at, for the building sector and cooling sector. So um, implementing uh, measures to, to collect and consolidate data be it through um, uh, mandatory disclosure processes or smart um, meters or smart collect uh, data collection devices is extremely important because it will inform future uh, policy development. So I'm coming to the end of um, summary of roadmaps and I just want to set the tone for the next steps. The very importantly, the next steps which um, we hope and encourage all member states to follow is to 
um, work with roadmaps to identify what are the key near-term actions for them, for their country, um, look at their current situation, do contextual analysis um, to understand what, what kind of policy instruments are already in place, what are the barriers, what is missing and what needs to be done. We encourage that it should be done through stakeholder engagement process that um, as we saw before, it's very important to get all the stakeholders on board, get their inputs into the policy development process and arrive at some sort of recommendations and uh, action plans for, for near term. So with that, I will, um, I will stop here and I'm looking forward to the following panel discussion, uh, which will focus on, on this topic as well. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, um, Mr. Amishenia, um, for your excellent presentation. Actually, now we have one question from Mr. Perasut, but because of time limitation, we will kindly address your question later on through the email. Thank you very much for your understanding. Now, we would like to move on to the next agenda, which is panel session. Now we'd like to invite to Mr. Septia Buntara Supendi, Renewable Energy and Energy Efficiency Department at Asian Center for Energy. Please join me to welcome Mr. Septia, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Christina, for the introduction. Um, well, good morning. Good afternoon and good evening to all of the audience here. I just received uh, information. We got around uh, 250 participants for uh, this platform, also our online platform. I think no wonder since um, we have a wonderful lineups here. Uh, first, I have a representative from Indonesia, Mr. Supriyadi. He is the policy analyst Directorate of Energy Conservation, Ministry of Energy and Mineral Resource of Indonesia. I think uh, he is the right person to seek guidance on the EE initiative in Indonesia. Hi, Pastor Priyadi, would you mind to open your camera? Yep, thank you, Mr. Septia. Excellent. Next, I have colleagues from Malaysia, Mr. Steve Anthony Lojuntin. He is the Director of Technical Development and Facilitation Division Sustainable Energy Development Authority or SEDA Malaysia. I think he is the, the prominent person to seek the planning and implementation of sustainable energy uh, development program, particularly on the technology, uh, technical, technical development in Malaysia. Hi, Mr. Steve. Hi, Mr. Septia. Ah, excellent. Yeah. Then I have two representatives from Singapore. First, Dr. Gao Chunping. He is the Director of Green Building Technology Department, Environmental Division, Sustainable Group, Building and Construction Authority of Singapore, as we know as BCA. And Mr. Ng Pei Chen, the Principal Engineer Label and Standard, Standard Climate Mitigation Division, Resource and Sustainability Group of Singapore. In short, I could say Dr. Gao is the right person to know about building initiatives, while Mr. Chen is the expert in the space cooling and standardization. Oh, what a day. We are very lucky to have both of you. Hi, Dr. Gao and Mr. Chen. Hi, Mr. Sapatia. Yeah, thank you for the intro. Excellent. Um, from Thailand, I have Mr. Acharya Jiang Chai, an engineer from the Department of Alternative Energy Development and Efficiency, or DEDE under Ministry of Energy of Thailand. He is responsible uh, for administering and providing financial support for energy conservation as specified by law. I think we, we want to know about the EE initiative in Thailand. Hi, Mr. Acharya. Good afternoon, Mr. Septia. Nice to see you and your team again in this platform. Excellent. Thank you so much. From ADB, I have the old friend of mine, Mr. David Morgado, the senior energy specialist at the ASEAN, Asian Development Bank. He provides operational support to regional and private sector departments and contributes to knowledge work on emerging new technologies in the energy sector. 
Prior joining ADB, he was Senior Energy Policy Specialist at the AIIB. Hi. Hi, Mr. David. Hi, Sepia. Great to see you again. Thank you. Great to see you again, David. Then we have Ms. Lily Riahi, the Coordinator, Cooling Coalition of UNEP, based in the Regional Office for Asia and the Pacific. Uh, Lily develops uh, and oversees a cooling and urban energy portfolio of program in the region. Hi, Ms. Lily. So, and lastly, we have uh, Dr. Senia Petrichenko, uh, which uh, I think uh, announced by the MC before. She is the expert from DIA, which mainly working with us, with ACE, on the roadmap development. Hi, Dr. Senia. Um, for the interest of time, I think uh, hopefully we have a sufficient time to discuss a lot of interesting topic uh, uh, moving forward. Uh, we'll just uh, start the, the session. I would go to my member states colleagues first. I think as we heard from Dr. Senia, a lot of interesting um, information there regarding the roadmap and also as briefly mentioned by Dr. Nuki earlier, we heard the presentation or showing of the ASEAN roadmaps on building and space cooling. And you have been following our, of course, the evolution of the work during the stakeholder consultation. We have done many forum group discussions Reflecting on the scope and proposed actions of the roadmaps and potential policy packages. Uh, so what do you think are the near-term priority implementation action for your country? Maybe I would like to provide five minutes. Maybe I would go to Mr. Supriyadi first, then followed by Mr. Steve, Dr. Gao for building, Mr. Chen for space cooling, and lastly to Acharya. So Mr. Supriyadi, please. Thank you, Mr. Satya. Uh, I try to uh, explain about uh, in Indonesia uh, regarding the roadmap about uh, building uh, sector. Uh, uh, at the moment, uh, the Ministry of Energy uh, of Mineral Resources uh, don't have a specific building in cooling roadmap yet uh, because the authority uh, for the building roadmap is in the Ministry of Public Work. Uh, at the moment, uh, ministerial regulation related to the building is in the Ministry of Public Work is uh, regarding about uh, green building, still about green building, not only a cooling sector, but about green building. Uh, regarding uh, regulation for implementing energy efficiency in buildings, uh, we try to regulate that energy consumption through uh, energy management. Uh, regulation related to energy management are still in government regulation number uh, 70, uh, 2009. Uh, we energy use, we uh, consume energy greater than or equal to 6,000 TUA are required to implement energy management. Uh, in practical, in the fields, this limited only cover industry. So we try to revise the threshold from uh, 6,000 TA to 500 TA for the building. So it's hope that building that consume energy greater than or equal to 500 are required to implement energy management, not only uh, building, uh, not only uh, cooling, but this all the energy management in, in the building. And we have, uh, although we have not regulated building obligation, we have uh, five buildings that have certified ISO uh, 50,001. Uh, about the energy management. And regarding air conditioning, we have uh, Ministry of Energy and Mineral Resources degrees about uh, maps, maybe Master Setia now. Uh, we have a uh, setting map still low because um, in Indonesia, not only uh, consider about the value of the energy efficient uh, energy efficiency ratio but we consider about the uh, power purchase 
because in the Indonesia we cannot give incentive to buy some something like IC and the other. This is challenge to 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 me and to the Indonesia to get uh, uh, more aggressive to implementasi implementasi this uh, energy. Uh, in this year, uh, to uh, we will cooperate with Denmark uh, through Indodep uh, to uh, energy efficiency cooperation partner and development uh, and energy efficiency roadmap and uh, zero energy burden catalog. I think uh, this collaboration will be launched on April 26, and I think with this agenda. We will be able to uh, increase our reference for the participant of the uh, net zero energy building roadmap. I think this uh, uh, we can share. Uh, we will very open to receiving uh, suggestion, suggestion and input from all participants. Thank you, Mr. Chapia. Very interesting information, Pak Supriyadi. I would highlight that currently no specific roadmap for space cooling, yeah? And of this uh, regional roadmap can be beneficial for country. In addition, you mentioned as well uh, the existing collaboration with Denmark. I think we're very open to, to support on this matter, uh, Mr. Supriyadi. Okay. Let's move on to Mr. Steve. Mr. Steve, please. Yeah, about the, the, the first question, right? Yes. Yeah, okay. Uh, I, thanks to us for the preparation of the roadmaps. Eh? <clears throat> Since these roadmaps are prepared based on internationals and ASEAN scenario with regards to achieve energy efficiency and towards uh, net zero carbon by 2050. And a lot of get engagement and input have been met within the ASEAN member state and representative, including from the Malaysia. <clears throat> in my opinion, both roadmaps uh, can be uh, ad adopted in Malaysia. But uh, the key uh, tools on energy efficiency is the building, is to have the uh, building energy code, which is what we call in Malaysia is the Malaysian standard MS1525, because of practice use of energy efficiency and renewable energy for non-residential building. Yeah? The one is actually we need to have that because it's become a technical and performance reference uh, for building development. I mean during the de development of the building, as well as when the building and the operationals. Eh? And of course, with the continuous enhancements program, with the current energy efficiency program in, in, uh, in Malaysia, and some of the measures already implemented in Malaysia, but on voluntary basis, like for example, the MS1525. Uh, although uh, the uh, Ministry of uh, Local Government had gazetted it, but uh, in Malaysia, we have uh, these three tier government's uh, concept, the federal, states, and the local authorities. The implementations of uh, new building developments is fall under the local authorities, actually, or the city councils, and because they approve the development of new building. But when come to a uh, building, when the building under operationals, and normally, uh, if it regards to energy, and this is where the uh, 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 coming, what I call uh, energy efficiency regulations uh, act uh, going to uh, monitor uh, the, the operations of the building, particularly the, the, the big one, so that uh, to ensure that the building uh, will keep what I call uh, having uh, improvement of the energy uh, performance from time to time. Yeah. Uh, Okay, since the building sector in Malaysia is quite complex, it involves several authorities, ministries, <clears throat> we have to look into the best way to address and the implementation so that it can be implemented smoothly. But again, uh, the policy must put in place first so that it can become a policy guide to all parties with uh, started with the government, industry and public in, to implement. I think uh, in general, uh, it can be uh, implemented because some of the component on inside the roadmaps is already uh, have and some implemented under the voluntary. But we need to have uh, what they call overall uh, uh, how to make it uh, uh, roadmaps that uh, can be implemented by various parties, not only uh, by the uh, 
under the Ministry of Energy and Energy Commissions, but also under the ministries that in charge of building development like the Ministry of Works, as well as the uh, authorities, uh, uh, local governments, which under another ministries. I think that is from uh, Malaysian side. Thank you. More it's mentioned by you and also Mr. Supriyadi earlier. It's the work of multi stakeholder engagement, yeah. And yeah. not only talking about one ministry, but also all ministries uh, which involve uh, in this kind of initiative. And this is kind of growing intention when you confirm that both roadmaps uh, I think can be adopted in Malaysia as long as uh, we have the policy reference into it. Very interesting. Thank you so much, Mr. Steve. And how about uh, from uh, to Dr. Gao and Mr. Chen, please? Uh, thanks, Abdiya. Uh, I think just to give a few thoughts, I think the work uh, um, on the, um, the two roadmaps are extremely important and useful. Uh, for Singapore, I think the situation is uh, in a way similar to the global um, trend, but uh, on the other hand, there is a, a certain uniqueness. In fact, uh, in Singapore, I think besides the, um, participating in the global efforts to drive energy security, and enhancing the energy security and the sustainable development. Uh, Singapore is a city state, and hence uh, and there's a lot of need. Uh, in fact, it is a, a probably a sheer need for Singapore to drive uh, uh, energy efficiency and the resource efficiency. So um, based on the sheer need, we have been actually driving this energy efficiency for building as well as cooling uh, uh, since decades ago. And uh, currently we are working towards uh, uh, a Singapore Green Building Master Plan, uh, which set the target of uh, uh, 80, 80, 80 uh, by 2030, uh, which means that uh, we like to achieve uh, our building stock to be greened by 80% of the building stock be, be green by 2030. And 80% uh, of the new buildings uh, should be built uh, based on the super low energy standards from 2030. And the last 80 refers to the 80% energy efficiency for our buildings uh, also by 2030. So in under the lens, under that vision, uh, um, on this question on the immediate priority, in fact, uh, we are currently looking at uh, a few areas. I mean, um, the, the roadmap is itself actually provide very detailed information about uh, the Singapore's uh, um, instruments of policies and incentives, et cetera including some of the basic building law, uh, building code, et cetera. But uh, uh, moving forwards, uh, there are three specific areas I think uh, we are particularly interested in. In fact, some of the areas have already been mentioned uh, just now by, uh, by Dr. Uh, Petrichenko. Yeah, uh, for example, the data, the importance of data. So um, we are now actually doing quite a lot of study and the data benchmarking about uh, our energy efficient building uh, so far, we gather, I think we started the green building journey since 2005. So um, today we have more than half of the Singapore's building, uh, I think more than 40% of the Singapore's building stopped by being green. So uh, with all this data there, uh, what would be the wisdom, what would be the actionable insights we can develop so that we can use the data to influence the second half of the building or probably uh, those buildings who actually set a more aspirational goal to achieve net zero. So um, we have been doing quite a lot of work recently on the um, artificial intelligence using machine learning techniques to develop some intelligence from the data we so far gather. And hopefully through that, uh, there could be certain um, smart advisory service that can be tapped on uh, from the data and uh, uh, some generalization can be achieved as well as uh, pull in some global um, information, global trends, including the roadmap that we are talking about here, the two important roadmaps um, to provide um, guidance for our buildings to move forward. So this is the first uh, uh, priority in fact we've been working on that. I think it's just timely that uh, we can tap on the resources from IE and the ACE to actually push it further. The second area, second priority we are actually uh, looking at is to look at the decarbonization of the building. I think this is also an important area which has been mentioned by the roadmap yeah, in very detailed, I think, manner. So uh, for us, uh, 
beyond 2030, just now I talk about three targets, uh, back to 2030. But beyond 2030, what is the decarbonization uh, roadmap? What is decarbonization uh, methods we wanted to implement? Uh, today, I think we are already implementing some efforts, uh, including the design for manufacturing, prefabrication, uh, using recyclable materials, etc., in the building uh, and construction. Uh, uh, there are some efforts already being there, but uh, as a city state, again, the uniqueness of Singapore is we import most of the building materials from overseas. So, how to do decarbonization? We also import even energy from overseas. So, the decarbonization of the energy supply, uh, so those are the topics that we are currently um, putting into our action plan to dive deeper and do some um, further study. So that uh, the wisdom or the recommendation from the decarbonization study will be able to guide us to the next stage of the development. And the, the last point I actually we are currently working on is the again the technologies and the innovation uh, that can help our building sector to move uh, in a more uh, sustainable and a more cost effective way. I think cooling has been discussed in the roadmap. I think mostly on the policy and the and the incentive, all those uh, uh, you know important area. But uh, in terms of technology, do we need the technology roadmap? Do we, how do we develop our technology policy? For example, uh, other than the conventional um, cooling, yeah, uh, the air conditioning actually do have a limit uh, based on the thermodynamics. So, uh, is there any uh, first principle approach we can adopt and we can consider? Is there any alternative uh, cooling solutions? Uh, for example, using evaporative cooling, which is probably a very difficult task in ASEAN country because we are really under a hot and humid environment. And uh, how about the opportunity brought about by smart and uh, you know, the, the AI technologies, which actually is uh, changing the world in many other sectors of our building sector. So um, the technology room and technology areas are is the third priority or probably the near term priority we are looking at. So I hope this uh, gives some sense and the trigger uh, for the discussion and welcome any comments on this point. Yeah. So maybe I hand over to my colleague, Eva, my uh, colleague, uh, Payne, and so have anything to add on the cooling aspect. Yeah, please. Thank you. Yes, Mr. Chair. Yes, uh, thank you, Mr. Sabia and Dr. Kong. Yeah, uh, for, so firstly, maybe just um, share uh, some of my thoughts with regards to the space cooling roadmap. Um, I think this is a very useful guide in terms of um, ha having all the different policy measures um, uh, noted down in a single document for countries to, to refer to. And uh, perhaps I'll just share a bit more with regards to how are we promoting or um, looking at how we can improve um, space cooling uh, in in the context of uh, using air conditioner as well as uh, refrigerators. Yeah, so um, um, for aircon and refrigerators, um, these are commonly used in household, um, especially in Singapore, where um, we are um, perhaps one of the highest uh, uh, proportion of household who owns air conditioner. And um, so, so for us, um, in terms of um, achieving our climate change goals, um, the use of aircon and refrigerator is a very important aspect that uh, we need to look into. Um, that's why um, our policy measures has so far been with regards to providing information as well as um, using regulation such as the minimum energy performance standards as mentioned uh, in the um, room room and guidelines. So, so for Singapore, um, we don't really have very long term roadmaps with regards to these two agreements because I think um, technology for appliances change very quickly. But uh, so, so that's why um, when we are looking at um, maps and the labeling for, for these two appliances, we do sort of um, monitor them very closely together with our stakeholders um, in, in order to push for greater. Um, efficiency for the air conditioners. Um, just to share, very recently, in fact, just early this year, we have uh, raised the maps for air conditioning and refrigerators. And uh, we have uh, raised it such that we phase out 
um, those inefficient windows and casement type of air conditioner. And also from the policy room, um, besides looking at energy efficiency, there's also a, a need to look at the refrigerant that uh, these appliances uses. Um, because um, it's not just about energy, it's about climate change um, goals or any emissions. So um, similar to that, we are also implementing um, some regulation with regards to the uh, limiting the type of refrigerant, um, household aircon and refrigerant, uh, the refrigerators can, can, can use. So that we will be implementing um, in a few months time. So um, only the low GWP type of uh, refrigerant, <coughs> refrigerant uh, coming um, will be able to be used from October onwards. Yeah, so um, yeah, perhaps I'll, I'll just stop here and uh, I'll pass on to the next speaker. Thank you. In short, you say, please make it uh, make sense uh, as possible, yeah, the short-term target and need to be adaptive with the condition. That's why in Singapore, uh, yeah, uh, currently uh, still looking at the short-term time uh, because of the situation and, and dynamic of the technology. And also like the three points from the Dr. Gao, uh, mentioning about the adaptability with the technology, the innovation and the decarbonization pathway. I think this is something very interesting to, to look forward. Thank you so much, Dr. Gao and Mr. Chen. Um, now go, uh, I'll go to uh, Mr. Acharya from Thailand. Mr. Acharya, please. Thank you, Satya. Uh, thank you very much uh, for the opportunity. I would like to uh, congratulate uh, IEA, uh, ASEAN Secretariat, Australian Government, ASEAN Center for Energy, and also EAC and Focal Point for the successful uh, launch on of these two roadmap, uh, building and uh, space cooling. So, in uh, Thailand context, actually, if we would like to uh, to to look back to the uh, the target of the uh, our commitment of our prime minister to focus and present during the COP26, so we have the uh, really uh, aspirational uh, target to reach uh, carbon neutrality uh, by uh, 2050, and then uh, net zero emission by uh, 2065. This is a really strong commitment to this. And this is also along with the uh, up by eight target, 32% by uh, 2025, right? So we would like to actually say, integrate uh, our plan, either a national plan or regional plan to have a international plan for the successful of uh, the, the target. So as uh, everyone know, in ASEAN, we have uh, a different, uh, different uh, level of the uh, energy efficiency plan. And also uh, we, we know that uh, in some countries have uh, not yet uh, implement uh, some of the policy measure or uh, enforcement or the plan that have to fulfill the target of the energy efficiency plan. So Thailand are uh, one of the uh, countries that have been implement uh, either uh, uh, cooling site or building site. For example, for the uh, building site, we have the implement uh, the building energy code with the, together with the uh, Department of Public Work uh, and town and uh, country planning to, to incorporate the building energy code into the Building Control Act uh, to enforce, start with uh, uh, 10,000 uh, square meter building, which is uh, actually we are uh, focusing on uh, the big building. And then uh, one year after we will uh, limit uh, for compliance to reduce to uh, 5,000 square meter and later will be uh, 5,000 square meter, uh, sorry, 2,000 square meter in the third year. So this is uh, the one that we uh, have been enforced and uh, official uh, enforced uh, since uh, March 2020. 
2021. So we are actually uh, looking uh, and focusing on the uh, Nai uh, building Thai, which is uh, most of them are the, the big buildings, such as uh, hospital, condominium, hotel, uh, academic institute, exhibition hall, uh, shopping mall, etc. So what we are uh, enforcement actually including all everything in the building have and, also, and it, especially uh, for the air conditioning system. So we will have that uh, enforcement and also we also have uh, the, the green building for the existing building working together uh, with uh, a Thai Green Building Institute um, to promote and uh, to encourage uh, building to using uh, uh, green building criteria for the uh, uh, new building and existing building. This is uh, what we have done uh, for the uh, building energy code and also for the building site. Another thing is uh, uh, cooling, especially uh, space cooling. So one of the uh, policy measures that we have been implement is about uh, MAPS and HEPS and also uh, harmonization of the testing standard. And again, it's also working together with the uh, stakeholder, with the partner that have been uh, in the uh, different ministry. For example, uh, we have uh, the MAPS standard working with the uh, TC. Thai Industrial Standard Institute uh, under the Ministry of Industry. And also we have also uh, uh, implement the number five sticker or the uh, 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 labeling for the uh, appliance that using in home, which is uh, uh, working together with the ECAP is a uh, uh, electrical state owned under the Ministry of Energy. And also uh, beside the DD, uh, Department of Alternative Energy and, uh, Development and Efficiency, we also uh, develop uh, another uh, labeling that we have been using for the uh, industrial product. This is uh, what we have done. We, we, we try to fulfill, we had to fulfill, we try to uh, have integrate all of the uh, ministry and all of uh, uh, stakeholder to 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 drive to drive uh, and to reach the uh, target of the energy efficiency because uh, we have the uh, the target under the uh, energy efficiency plan uh, 2018 to reduce uh, EI or energy intensity 30 percent uh, by uh, 2036 based on uh, 2010. And then right now, because uh, our prime minister have a strong commitment to the world. So as you know that energy efficiency, uh, energy sector is one of the most uh, sector that contribute a lot into the CO2 emission. So we try to uh, setting and uh, 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 developing the new uh, energy efficiency plan, which is will be uh, soon present later. So I think uh, they are trying to to to, to uh, increase the energy efficiency. Uh, sorry, energy intensity for more than thirty percent that we have done before, and once again uh, to harmonize all of the ASEAN countries to have the the the, the same level of the standard the same level of the uh, measurement, the same level of uh, the plan. So this uh, roadmap that prepared by uh, EIA and AS is, is one of the, uh, the, uh, the important uh, roadmap that to set up the plan for our uh, ASEAN, for the region, and then we'll contribute to uh, world uh, carbon dioxide emission target of the world. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Acharya. And yeah, as you highlighted, uh, there is already in place high level commitment yeah, from Thailand. And also not only uh, at the high level, but also at the working level, you guys implemented strong enforcement. And 
uh, enhancing more and more the MAP standard. I think this is very, uh, very good. And it's also actually related with APEC phase two, as you mentioned. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Acharya. Um, Dr. Senia, um, having a very promising answers from the panel, um, any feedback from you regarding the priority actions or the base uh, activities in, in the member states? I, I know you, you might have several curiosity to ask the member states uh, panel here, but let me set the QA uh, as part near the end of our session today. Maybe uh, for two or three minutes uh, respond from you, please. Thank you, Septia. I think I will be very quick to give uh, the speakers an uh, opportunity to speak, but um, it has been uh, really great to hear that uh, a lot of progress is being made already in these areas. Um, and uh, I was happy to hear about the emphasis on, <clears throat> on data and the regulation parts. I think these are two uh, areas which are coming out of the roadmaps very strongly, so strengthening the regulation and strengthening the, the data collection and the accessibility for both buildings and appliances. Um, so I would be happy to, to discuss this with member states further, how we on IE side can, can support them uh, in that regard. Um, another, another area I think which um, came out from the cooling roadmap is that um, the incentives for uh, cooling appliances is not always uh, present in member states, and we also heard uh, that point before. So, how we can, um, how how member states can design this kind of programs, maybe targeted to low income uh, households specifically to support them to transition towards more uh, energy efficient appliances. We had uh, also a question in the in the Q and A um, uh, section uh, regarding dumping the the. Um, old uh, air conditioners and old appliances in the region, how to solve uh, this problem. I know it's a huge problem for ASEAN. <clears throat> and uh, in the roadmap, we also touch upon that, uh, how we can support low-income households. There are replacement programs. There are some best practices uh, from international arena, how we can um, design the equity programs, the, the incentive in terms of rebates and the uh, low um, interest uh, in uh, loans uh, for specific for specific groups it also applies to buildings because uh, when it comes to improving energy efficiency especially in existing buildings it's very often overlooked uh, I think from our analysis it also uh, comes through very clearly that uh, existing buildings in in the region are um, have quite low energy performance and we don't know exactly how low it is because we have a um, um, lack of data in that regard. But as the, as the time, pa time passes by, the existing buildings will stay here consuming a lot of energy. So um, I think that's another important aspect to integrate in the, in the policy development and the regulation. Uh, I think uh, I will stop here, uh, and but happy to to discuss in more details with the with the member states. Uh, I know we are a bit short on, on time, so thank you. Excellent, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Senia, for your response and the feedback. Um, next, I would like to go to UNEP and IDB colleagues. Um, maybe I go to uh, Miss Dilly first. Um, as you heard from the panel and feedback from uh, the IEA, in your opinion. What are the most important near-term actions for ASEAN countries to move towards sustainable and efficient building in space building based on your expertise and experience, Ms. Ms. Lili? Well, uh, thank you so much. Am I unmuted? Yes. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Um, well, I know time is short. So first, I want to say uh, congratulations to the excellent roadmaps that have been developed uh, by um, IEA and uh, ACE and and with Australian aid, I think um, they really speak to what we support as well and what we think is best practice at, at UNEP. Um, mm -hmm. If to answer your question on the on the three key areas of immediate action, I think one of them, one of the key areas is very much linked to what Ksenia was just mentioning, and that's really financing um, efficiency in the residential sector. So I think um, we see really two key issues here. 
and that is obviously the first cost bias. So um, many households are not willing or they're not able to pay a premium for efficiency, um, whether it's a super efficient fan or super efficient AC or a green home. Um, and of course, split incentives where the developers um, are not responsible for the long-term use or uh, um, associated energy bills of buildings or development. And we know, as we heard from Ksenia earlier, that households in ASEAN um, with AC will be will be growing rapidly. I think you said something like two ACs per household. Um, so, uh, and at the same time, the urban housing stock is going, growing rapidly. So I think addressing these two issues uh, will be really important. Um, so beyond efficiency standards and building codes, which will shift the market, is really low cost financing targeting those first time uh, buyers who will finally be able to afford AC or um, you know, a well-built home. Uh, that I think is gonna be really key as a near term action. Um, and again, I think in particular, um, focusing on you know, um, social housing um, you know, or affordable housing, um, Will be will be important providing you know uh, maybe some kind of on bill financing with low interest credit or um, innovative models linked to green buildings um, will be very very important. Then the second thing to highlight um, is what, what I would call low cost, no regret, quick to deploy solutions. So. Um, we know that ASEAN countries, as we heard from speakers, are facing heat stress, and um, this is even more intense in cities because of the urban heat island effect. Um, and we see that urbanization is growing quickly. And you know, this heat stress is not just about public health, which is critical, and the the increasing lives that are lost due to heat stress, but also it's uh, cutting GDP. Uh, co uh, costing um, jobs uh, productivity in the economy. So it's really important to tackle. But um, uh, and but in urban in urban areas, obviously the first uh, choice is obviously to turn to air conditioning, and usually um, this is not always the uh, this is usually the most affordable air conditioning and not always the most efficient, um, which is just creating this vicious cycle of creating um, more excess heat in the city because of the heat that is, is uh, emitted from air condition mechanical cooling, and then the uh, heat island effect within the city that causes um, cities to be like up to a few degrees hotter than the rest of the areas. Um, and so what governments can do quickly now, um, we, we did a unit publication recently called Beat the Heat, and it was really looking at these kind of low cost solutions that can be deployed. Um, in urban areas to cut cooling demand. And that can include like urban greening um, in hot spots across the country. Uh, it can be cool roofs or green roofs um, and cool surfaces, especially in social housing. These are like low cost solutions for people who can't afford AC and improved air urban design. Now, these solutions have been proven to uh, achieve a reduction in cooling loads of more than 25%. So it's not a, it's not a, just a, you know, let's plant some trees and you know, hopefully things will get better, but it has shown a real impact on cooling load. Um, and urban heat, I think US EPA has shown that every one degree reduction in urban heat, uh, the electricity demand for air conditioning could drop by around 4% on average. So that's just some numbers to say, this is really important in ASEAN and I think it's a quick solution. And countries like Vietnam, for example, are, um, you know, we're, we're working with Vietnam, for example, to deploy these solutions. And they're setting up, you know, a national fund um, to support the deployment of such, such solutions. And last um, is, I think, national cooling action plans is, a, is a, some, something I'd like to highlight linked to data also, and also linked to what Dr. Gao mentioned earlier about HFC reduction. So um, we shouldn't forget, obviously, that due to the Kigali Amendment, the cooling sector is retooling to phase down HFCs or getting ready to do that. And this HFC phase down will reduce, like will result in a, a 0.4 degree reduction um, of global warming by the end of the century. So an IEA and UNEP report um, called the Cooling Synthesis Report showed that coupling that with energy efficiency will, double the climate benefits. So we have a real opportunity here to couple energy efficiency and HFC plans. And national cooling action plans is one of the ways in which a country or many countries have already started to um, you know, kind of develop a pathway on how they can um, bring these two um, important sectors together and take uh, joint actions. So, um, 
uh, with SCAP, with UN SCAP, uh, UNEP and World Bank and GIZ and our multiple entities created a methodology on national cooling action plans, including data, uh, how to collect the data and do projections of you know, current um, cooling demand, future demand, and what are the interventions that can be taken. And you're looking at countries like Cambodia, Indonesia, um, you know, we've been working with them to develop these national cooling action plans. And in Cambodia, you know, they really were able to bring together seven ministries to develop this cooling action plan and using the data that they were able to collect across the ministries and analyze, looking at HFC and energy efficiency together. They were able to confidently put several measures in their NDC and also unlock climate finance to integrate, um, you know, some passive cooling measures into their building uh, building uh, guidelines, which is something they're working on now. So I think this is these are just some examples of actions that I think can be taken um, rather quickly um, to transform the market in the ASEAN. And I think these are 100% in line with what IEA and ACE um, have highlighted also in the in the roadmaps. And as UNEP, we would be very happy to to um, further support their implementation. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Lily. Uh, when we talk about cooperation, it's not only talking about the country and external party, but also within that country. As you mentioned, the example in Cambodia, right? I think everybody needs to have similar understanding uh, for uh, cool coalition. As, uh, as you mentioned, we need to make a similar target all together so we can be easier for us to achieve the target later on. And one of the important highlights that you mentioned about financing, this is also very important. Uh, and somehow related with the data because uh, we need appropriateness there. We need uh, something really relevant with the condition. So it's talking about supply and demand of the support. That's why I want to go to David. Uh, uh, one of the challenges for implementation that we often hear uh, about difficulties uh, government experience in um, accessing finance uh, for project and policy implementation. So, so David, uh, would you share about ADB's work in ASEAN and how how you work uh, with our government to bridge this gap uh, between demand uh, and supply for the funding. Uh, David, please. Uh, thank you, Sakhir, for your question. Before I start, I would like to thank the International Energy Agency and the ASEAN Center for Energy for the invitation to be here today to, to discuss this. Uh, apologies, David, about. would you mind to raise your voice a bit? Uh, Hi, can you hear me? Is it better now? Hi, it's, it's much better. Okay, I'll, I'll speak a bit louder. Um, I, 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 before I start, I'd like to thank the International Energy Agency and the ASEAN Center for Energy for the invitation to be here today to discuss this important topic. I would also like to congratulate the International Energy Agency, the ASEAN Center for Energy and ASEAN members for the launch of these roadmaps. The Asian Development Bank is committed to being the climate finance bank for the Asia and Pacific region. Personally, we've increased our ambitious uh, ambition level of climate financing to $100 billion dollars from 2019 to 2030. Secondly, at least 75% of ADB's operations will be supporting climate change by 2030. And thirdly, we will align all our operations with the goals of the Paris Agreement. We recognize that global energy transition will require trillions of dollars of new investment, including about $1 trillion per year in Asia Pacific alone from now until 2030. In 2021, amidst the COVID pandemic, ADB have provided about uh, $800 million uh, to clean energy investments in our development member countries. And we recognize that this is just a drop in the ocean and well below what ADB can deliver in a normal year. In, in September 2021, ADB launched its uh, new energy policy, uh, which aims to help our developing member countries to accelerate the development of sustainable and resilient energy systems that provide reliable, affordable access for all, fostering inclusive economic growth and social development, and support, of course, the low carbon transition in Asia and the Pacific. We're actively working with the ASEAN governments to bridge the gap between demand and supply of funding for the energy transition. And ADB realizes that accelerating the development of sustainable and reliable energy systems in developing countries requires additional concessional financing and also technology transfers. ADB is helping to develop capital markets and offering its full range of financial instruments from grants to sovereign, non-sovereign loans across a range of modalities, such as green bonds, credit enhancements and guarantees, and private sector equity. ADB is also engaging in policy dialogue and providing technical assistance and knowledge solutions to governments. 
In ASEAN specifically, we've set up innovative financing platforms that support green, resilient, and inclusive recovery from COVID-19, such as the ASEAN Catalytic Green Finance Facility and the ASEAN Green Recovery Platform, which are expected to leverage funds from capital markets and private sector investments for low-carbon infrastructure, including for energy efficiency and renewable energy. More specifically, the ASEAN Catalytic Green Finance Facility provides ASEAN governments with technical assistance and access to over $1 billion in loans from co-financing partners. It can be used by ASEAN governments to identify and prepare, prepare commercially viable green infrastructure projects. Other examples of financing platforms that can support clean energy solutions include the ADD Ventures and the Clean Energy Facility Partnership Facility. Finally, as governments, an ADB financing alone is not sufficient to bridge this trillion dollar gap for the clean energy transition. NEB is also working closely with several financial institutions to leverage further private sector financing and scale up climate and green finance for clean energy solutions in Asia and the Pacific region through the following four processes. Firstly, using our financial intermediation loan modality, we're partnering with national development banks and other financial institutions to design and implement new financing tools suited to the market needs. Specifically in this area in Sri Lanka, ADB is providing 50 million US dollar credit line through the government to multiple local banks for financing rooftop solar PV systems and buildings. The project has been so su successful that we're now considering a second 50 million dollar tranche. Secondly, by developing national and regional climate and green finance facilities to catalyze public and private investment for, for clean energy projects, including energy efficiency. In Indonesia, for example, we're working with PTSMI, which is a national financing entity, to design a $150 million green finance facility on the, the broader sustainable development for Indonesia and platform. Thirdly, by mobilizing climate co-financing for, for local financial institutions in the People's Republic of China, the ADB is supporting the government of Shandong province to develop a $1.5 billion US dollar Shandong Green Fund for low carbon and climate resilient infrastructure, including energy efficiency buildings. The facility has already mobilized about $300 million from AFD, KFW, and Green Climate Fund. Fourthly and finally, by leveraging the strength of local financial institutions to target pro poor clean energy access. In Palau, we are working with the National, De Bank, uh, National Development Bank of Palau to set up a clean energy financing facility initially focused on residential solar and energy efficiency for poor and female headed households. This is just a quick overview of what we're doing, but glad to expand further during the discussions today and be conscious of time. Thank you, Sophie. Thank you very much for the excellent sharing, uh, David. And yeah, it's not as, sim as simple as that. Uh, uh, there is uh, something related with the high level policy dialogue that ADP conducting so as for the member states and also how you guys uh, provide uh, technicalities uh, for the energy access and at the end how uh, we come up with a tangible project which beneficial for the local people around the countries as well um yeah i think this is a very interesting uh, point from you uh, david thank you very much um we, we have heard about yeah recently how adb provides support and how unep share experience on the uh, near-term priority should be, and and there is also a um, comment from the IEA regarding the uh, the anticipation for uh, for the member states to implement the, the roadmap. Uh, I would go to Pak Supriyadi, Mr. Sif, and uh, Mr. Acharya. Um, in from from your point of view, uh, any feedback uh, regarding the answers uh, from uh, the IEA, from UNEP and ADB, and maybe what. What is the issue uh, do you anticipate during the future implementation of the roadmap or maybe your, in the, your existing plan uh, for the NE initiative? And maybe you could uh, also tie in with the role of the ASEAN, the APAI or ACE at the regional level. I would go to Pak Supriyadi first, please. Yeah, thank you, Mentor Septia. Uh, I think it's, uh, we try to, uh, to reference about the roadmap uh, have made with uh, IA because we have a uh, plan to revise the uh, government regulation. Uh, I think this is uh, starting to 
to to encourage to encourage uh, in the building sector i think it's it's more important to to uh, uh, to prefer to reference uh, about uh, this uh, roadmap thank you this is a very good uh, notes uh, thank you so much pak supriyadi and as mentioned by dr senia we are very welcome to 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 receive any uh, request from you uh, regarding detailing uh, the support from our side uh, from the asean level uh, and the ace uh, perspective also at the global level i think i would also uh, think we also uh, can ask also support maybe from unep and adb later on if needed uh, especially for the case of indonesia thank you so much pak supriyadi How about uh, from Malaysia perspective, uh, Mr. Steve, please? Yeah, thank you much. In my opinion, uh, uh, as mentioned just now, the roadmap, both roadmap can be adopted, uh, but need further discussions and engagement with key stakeholders, various levels to suit the existing uh, and coming, and also the coming related policies, eh, regulations, industry adaptations. Uh, this will involve discussion awareness standard guideline and must maybe also demonstrations of what I call uh, technologies uh, or lesson to provide lesson learned and so on. Uh, I think uh, assistance uh, in terms of financial uh, assistance, technicals, technology assistance it will be good there. But again, uh, as mentioned just now, uh, since in Malaysia we have so many uh, what they call parties involved, uh, in, including what they call several ministry. And uh, when it comes to buildings, as mentioned just now, the parties that improve or approve uh, new building development is the local authorities. Uh, maybe because of they're not in the positions, uh, uh, what they call look into how the federals uh, look, I mean, in terms of uh, the overarching scenario and so on. But maybe they look into within their municipalities they own. But I think uh, while uh, we uh, to address this one, I think uh, we need to look not only from the angle of energy securities of the country, uh, <clears throat> because uh, it has very often less uh, acceptance or motivations by the uh, parties. Uh, like for example, I, I mentioned here local authorities because they approve the building uh, development, and uh, we need to address from the angle of that can create the interest. Yeah. Like for example, nowadays globally, people talking about climate change uh, initiative or carbon reduction, carbon neutral program, and so on. And now in Malaysia, there's the numbers of low carbon cities program uh, already what they call uh, uh, implemented in numbers of uh, cities or what they call local authorities. And uh, from our uh, discussion with them, I think uh, when we talk about low carbon building to support the low carbon cities. And then they start to show interest. When you talk about energy efficiency in terms of energy security, uh, they, they're not interested. <laughs> so if we can, uh, what they call, uh, convince uh, them from the angle of uh, low carbon, why not? And for example, in Malaysia, uh, there's a numbers of local authorities, for example, like Kuala Lumpur, the Dewan Bandar Kuala Lumpur, they already have a program uh, to achieve 70% intensity of carbon reduction by 2030 in Kuala Lumpur and 2050 carbon neutral, uh, one of the area Wang Samaju. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think from the discussions, if they wanted to reduce more than 50% of the carbon as well as the carbon neutral for building sector, uh, green building alone just uh, is not enough. So they need to do beyond, meaning to say energy efficiency must be maybe at least 50% and coupled with renewable energy. And they already gazetted uh, for new development of building to have what they call 30% uh, of the renewable energy or for new building uh, in new development. So I think this is the new area uh, they, because they're interested on the carbon reductions and under the low carbon cities program. And uh, they're also already talking about zero energy building program or high performance low carbon building which is uh, definitely the energy efficiency and renewable energy there. So maybe this is another approach that uh, we look into uh, to, uh, to, to have uh, what I call uh, uh, aligning between uh, the federal's uh, what they call uh, aspirations 
and the local authorities uh, what they call aspiration to achieve the same goal because in Malaysia we have target to achieve 45% uh, GHG intensity reduction by uh, 20, uh, 30, 35. So I think maybe this is another approach and it works, it works. When I measure about low carbon building and then uh, two local authorities are interested to, to actually adopt the MS standard, eh? the Malaysian standard MS1525 and we are in the process of engaging them and we hope that one of the local authorities will hope, we hope gazetted the, the standard and if they gazetted full uh, range of the uh, standard, meaning to say it will be the first local authorities and the others will follow. I think that's another good thing. Because uh, whatever we do, target in terms of when I call uh, the content of uh, uh, energy efficient building, space cooling and so on, they're still referring back to the, the, the guideline also the standards. I think that is the, the, uh, the development that in Malaysia. Uh, I think uh, uh, it's good uh, news here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Axel. Yeah. Thank you yeah. so much, Mr. Steve. Yeah. We heard about uh, the policy adaptation challenge uh, from Mr. Supriyadi, and we heard about the coordination challenge, uh, the localities understanding from Mr. Steve. How, how about in Thailand, uh, Mr. Acharya? What is the, the issue that you maybe anticipate during the implementation of maybe the program, as you mentioned, or maybe something related with our maps? Yes. Thank you very much, Septia. Uh, actually, uh, I would like to uh, uh, say that in Thailand, we have uh, energy conservation fund, or we call the Econ fund. Actually, uh, collect a small amount of the money from the oil price to uh, using to promote the energy efficiency uh, project. And Actually, under uh, this fund, uh, not only using for the Ministry of Energy, but using for all uh, uh, either uh, uh, university institute or uh, the company or uh, non-profit company that would like to implement the energy efficiency project. Basically, uh, under the project that we uh, implement under uh, this fund, we, we, we do have, for example, uh, this year, we implement the uh, direct subsidy. Uh, we give the 20% or 30% for the, the project that would like to uh, uh, changing some machine or have some uh, energy efficiency improvement, etc. And then they will get 20% uh, to subsidy for the project and also 30% uh, for the uh, new and uh, innovation for the project, uh, the new project like IoT or something that we think uh, this is, uh, uh, would be not uh, uh, like uh, normal or should be uh, very advanced. So we keep 30% uh, for the project. That one, this is uh, we call a direct subsidy. Another one, uh, we uh, implement the soft loan we call the revolving fund the soft loan that we have. Uh, we actually uh, uh, get some grant from the uh, income fund and then uh, uh, bring uh, to the uh, uh, financial institute to provide the uh, low interest rate loan to the uh, company. So the bank will uh, collect all of the money back after uh, the project have been implemented and sent back to the fund. And once again, uh, recently, as, as we know that uh, today the oil price is uh, skyrocket. So it's uh, very uh, uh, expensive right now. And uh, the money that we collect, uh, some more money that we collect from the oil price is uh, still also low. So uh, we also seeking and exploring the chance uh, to, to find out where are the, uh, some uh, grant or some budget that we would like to implement to the project. Uh, recently, uh, we have been uh, talking uh, with the bank. We have been talking with the uh, uh, Bank of Thailand, also a financial institute to see because uh, right now uh, in Thailand, we, we uh, have some uh, budget from the government we call uh, the 
uh, uh, recovery, uh, the COVID-19 recovery uh, uh, grant is cost about, I think, uh, 10,000 million USD. So it's not actually uh, provided uh, to the energy efficiency project only, but this is actually uh, provide to the recovery, the, uh, the suffer during the pandemic. So they provide to the uh, Ministry of Public Health, they provide to the uh, another uh, related uh, ministry. And then uh, now are they after two years, after two years, so they are planning, they are planning to uh, have the uh, uh, transformation, this fund to support more energy efficiency and uh, renewable energy project. So we are actually under a uh, discussion how uh, Ministry of Energy will engage to, the, to this fund and then uh, later uh, to implement and uh, utilize this fund to support energy efficiency and uh, renewable energy project. This is also uh, sometimes, uh, as we know that sometimes uh, the bank will only give the, uh, the loan to the big enterprise rather than the SME. So we also uh, 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 helping the SME because uh, they also would like to implement in the energy efficiency and uh, renewable energy project. So we are collab uh, work together with the uh, uh, Thailand uh, Credit Guarantee or TCG to support whether if uh, uh, the, the SME doesn't have uh, the credit. So the Thai credit guarantee will be support and they will just uh, pay for uh, a small money to, uh, to, 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 to that organization. And then later we also are talking with the, uh, the board of investment to wrap up about uh, the, the, the tax that uh, we that they are actually collect from the maybe some kind of the materials import tax or etc that will be uh, support the project in Thailand to be reach our goal to reduce uh, carbon emission. This is uh, actually some project are still ongoing and some project uh, we are under uh, under uh, discussion to be implemented soon and. I think this is uh, the things that Thailand have uh, uh, some experience, uh, maybe uh, under the umbrella of the ASEAN, we are uh, also the chair of the EENC SSN uh, for And then uh, we, are, we are happy to, to disseminate, to share, and uh, we are learning together, learning together, uh, and then uh, we are, uh, uh, working together to reach uh, APAIEC target goal. And then our aspiration uh, regional target under the ESC SSN. Excellent. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Acharya, regarding your view uh, in Thailand. Uh, may I check with Dr. Gupta and Mr. Chen on your experience, uh, what type of policy instrument uh, could be regulation, information, or incentive have been most effective at achieving uh, change in energy efficiency. Would you like to share your perspective? Maybe uh, one, one minute for each of you, please. Dr. Gao, please. Yeah, yeah, perhaps uh, I'll go first. Yeah, so um, for, for aircon and refrigerator, um, currently uh, what we think is most efficient would be to, to use uh, regulation. Uh, which is to set the maps level because um, this um, by doing so we will be certain of uh, the type of products or the inefficient products that will be removed from the market and uh, of course labeling would then help to um, promote those which are of higher efficiency um, perhaps I didn't share just now but um, we are also looking at providing incentives for the lower income household to purchase um, refrigerators um, we currently don't have incentives for air conditioner because um, currently what we think if we were to incentivize people to purchase aircon which uh, they, they may purchase aircon 
uh, it uh, it will lead, it may lead to uh, proliferation of uh, for more air cons. Uh. That's why that's why um, currently right now we only have uh, incentives for uh, purchasing of efficient uh, refrigerators. Yeah. So so I guess for household, um, it's uh, also um, regarding um, providing information and education. That is why we are also working very closely with the stakeholders in terms of um, at the purchasing point, the salesperson um, is aware how they are um, trying to get the consumer to purchase more energy efficient appliances, even though it may be more uh, costlier uh, upfront. Yeah, so yeah, in short, for me, that's all, thanks. Excellent, thank you so much, uh, uh, Mr. Chen for your sharing. I think we, we heard a lot of uh, very good feedback from, from the member states on this matter. Because of the limitation of the time, uh, we almost uh, uh, end at the session. Uh, we need to finish at uh, 4.15 Jakarta time. Maybe I would like to seek your guys your last comment uh, regarding the, the roadmaps, uh, the initiatives, uh, the feedback for the future uh, regional energy and efficiency initiative, in particular for building and space cooling. Maybe we would like to uh, check first with uh, David first, please. Maybe uh, only one or two minutes. Yes, that, thanks, Seth. I think that the roadmaps are a really important uh, starting point for, for the governments. Of course, as they mentioned, the governments already have in place uh, several of the uh, policies. Now it's the case of uh, looking at how we can uh, enforce them and what act, specific actions uh, need uh, financing and so uh, very keen to work with the governments and uh, that are here, the ASEAN member governments, to uh, implement a lot of the actions and uh, provide the necessary financing. So looking forward to, to continue uh, a lot of these discussions and actually implement a lot of the uh, actions that are mentioned in the roadmaps. So thank you. Excellent. Let's do something after this. Referring to the roadmap, of course, yeah, together with the IEA, maybe with UNEP. Maybe uh, Miss Lily, please. Yes, thank you so much. Um, I think uh, I would agree that the, the roadmaps, as I said, are, are really um, well done. And um, I think the, the key points about um, how to move ahead with um, implementation in terms of um, establishing and engaging a multi-stakeholder group, you know, at the country level. I think this is something that I heard repeatedly across also the, the government interventions, that there's this importance of bringing together the various stakeholders, uh, even across ministries or um, vertically from national to sub-national level. So I think that's something that um, is is really key. And, um, you know, we've, we've had some experiences working, as I mentioned, with Vietnam and Cambodia on this uh, already and and um, and also a little bit in Indonesia and we would be very happy to support um, efforts on translating those roadmaps into sort of governance and then um, policy actions. The only other thing I would say is that um, I think what I like very much about the roadmaps and what is really important to take away I think is that especially when it comes to cooling um, and heat resilience we really need to take a whole systems approach and so it has to, we can't only air condition our way out of the crisis. I think it has to be, you know, taking solutions at multiple scales. And I think the roadmaps uh, emphasize that. So it's, you know, the household level, yeah, with super efficient low GWP racks, okay. But also the buildings, you know, um, with thermally efficient design and construction. And then also, you know, neighborhoods and, and, and local or subnational level with some of the passive measures, um, nature-based solutions, heat resilient planning and equity, um, equity measures. So I think that's something that I, I would like to emphasize as a key point um, to take away from the roadmaps. I think you mentioned right to the point. Thank you so much, uh, Lily, for your feedback. Uh, maybe Dr. Senia, please, or you have any also uh, questions to our uh, member states here, please. Thank you, Septia. Um, I think maybe just to, to summarize regarding the, the advice from IEA on, on next steps, but I think we captured most of the points. Um, we do encourage each member state to really look at the current uh, state of place and the context in, in their country to understand what kind of policies are already in place, what 
consequences are missing, what are the key barriers, maybe what needs to be done to mitigate those barriers. And as Lily was saying, the stakeholder um, collaboration around those issues are very important. So we advise for the implementation process to really have um, a governmental entity which will lead the process of implementation, can be one of the ministries, who will then unite and uh, create a working group or task force across different ministries involved in, the, in these areas and have a very informed discussion. We also encourage, um, as one of the panelists was saying, to get uh, other um, levels of governments of, on board, to have cities represented, to have provinces represented, so that they have voice in this process as well and they feel included from the very beginning that it doesn't feel like there is some sort of a, um, a, a regulation just passed on them and they might not be interested or willing to comply but if they're included in the process from the very beginning the implementation which does happen at the local level uh, might become much more efficient and really encourage cities also to play a leading role to encourage governmental entities uh, to lead by examples uh, sometimes it's easier to start with municipal and governmental buildings and uh, showcase uh, energy efficiency improvement and low carbon measures there, and then expand these good examples to residential buildings. Also work with private sector. Private sector has a lot of um, capital which they can spend on low carbon uh, measures and also uh, provide some non-financial incentives like awards, recognition, or uh, other programs uh, which can increase the image, for example, of certain companies who are investing in uh, low carbon building development. So I think um, I'll, I'll stop here, but thank you very much for all your very interesting inputs and uh, sharing your experience. That's quite unfair. You covered everything, Senia, I think, <laughs> from the discussion. Um, uh, we we noted uh, for the coordination issue, understanding and ownership issue. I think let, let's uh, tackle that challenge all together by cooperating uh, intensively uh, uh, as a way forward. Uh, as uh, as we represent then ASEAN member states, it's keen to collaborate uh, with you guys, David and Ms. Lily, and of course with the IA, it's our close partner. And uh, feel free to approach us for any uh, discussion, especially for example, like Indonesia, you want to have developed dedicated roadmaps in the, uh, in the near future. So very interesting discussion. However, I, I need to make apologies for the audience uh, who already uh, provide their question to the chat box. Uh, we will try our best to answer that uh, through email as mentioned by Christina earlier. So I would like to, I think we already uh, at the end of the session of the discussion. First and foremost, I would like to express my very high appreciation to the speakers here and panelists for the valuable contribution to the discussion. My deepest, deepest uh, gratitude as well goes to all who attended the workshop and for our internal team who helped to make it a such a successful event. Thanks, Emily, Rio, Christina, Senia, Indra, and all. By this, uh, from the ASEAN Center for Energy, uh, ASEAN Sector IA, we would like to officially launch the roadmaps towards sustainable and energy efficient building and space cooling in ASEAN. We really hope uh, that the report could bring more and more perspective to set a tangible action on the way forward of the ASEAN Plan of Action for Energy Cooperation Phase 2. Again, thank you very much for your attention. Back to MC and have a good day all. Thank you very much, Mr. Septia, and to all of the panelists for fruitful and insightful discussion during the panel session. Now, I would like to move on to the next agenda. Yeah, so for the next session is closing remark that will be delivered by Ms. Mary Gail Gisagon, Assistant Director, Head of Energy and Mineral Division, the ASEAN Secretariat. Ms. Mary, the time is yours. Yes, uh, thank you, Christina. And uh, good day to everyone, wherever you are joining from. Um, very interesting and informative discussions today, uh, befitting the launch of these two very important policy documents that we have been working on for the last uh, year or so. Today's event has clearly been an opportunity to reflect on our efforts thus far on EE for, building, uh, for cooling and buildings and um, the individual AMS and regional challenges and the avenues for collective action. From the ASEAN Secretariat and on behalf of the multi-party team from 
uh, IEA, ASI, uh, ASEAN Center for Energy, the AEDCP2 program, um, and also from, from ASIC's Energy and Minerals Division, we thank and acknowledge the speakers, experts, and participants in today's event. Um, we, of course, heard from the host country, Cambodia, Mr. Nong, uh, also the Thailand uh, coordinator as chair of EENC, uh, Mr. Uh, Panduang, the uh, ambassador for Australia uh, mission to ASEAN, uh, His Excellency uh, Will Nankervis, and also the executive, deputy executive director of uh, IEA. Um, we also, of course, uh, heard from uh, ACED's uh, ACD Dr. Nuki and IEA Dr. Senya uh, in their context setting presentations and the views from our expert panels uh, from member states are very, very um, enlightening uh, from Indonesia, Mr. Supriardi, from Malaysia, uh, Mr. Logentin, from Singapore, uh, BCA's Dr. Gao and Nias, uh, Mr. Chen, and also from Thailand, uh, Mr. AJ. Um, and our specialists from, from uh, ADB and uh, UNEP, uh, Mr. Morgado and Mr. Ria Ria Riahi. Um, so all in all, our, we, we, we heard our speakers highlighting uh, and uh, discussing our situation in ASEAN today, um, basically um, with the context that uh, we are targeting 32% intensity reduction by 2025, our achievements thus far, the policy imperatives that are besetting the energy sector and, and, and beyond, um, the expected rapid energy demand growth in the region and how actions and building uh, and space cooling can make significant impact on achieving these uh, tar uh, targets. We also heard the broad implications of our ability to rein in energy demand on the region's energy security, as well as the energy efficiency's contributions to lowering emissions. Uh, and in this light, we also uh, want to take this opportunity to highlight that the ASEAN's expressed intent to explore an aspirational long-term regional target towards lower energy uh, systems uh, in the region, lower emission energy systems in the region, as was stated in the Bandar Seri Begawan Joint Declaration on Energy Security and Energy Transition that was adopted in, uh, in September 2021 by the um, ASEAN Ministers of Energy. Um, we highlight this because we know that these roadmaps are one of the uh, uh, crucial elements that would form uh, uh, that would help us translate our pathways to such a target. Um, we really believe that energy efficiency is uh, foregone energy demand and is often really acknowledged to be the cheapest latent source of energy. Um, the making of these roadmaps, as we all know, uh, was uh, done in a rather intense set of uh, sort of a continuous set of activities uh, uh, for a year and a half under the fall of the pandemic. And But even then, we had... Uh, we had at least four workshops, uh, two for each of the roadmaps, plus many, many consultations with AMS at various levels, including with the technical working groups, as well as the focal points. And then we also uh, had time to do four webinars open to the public, um, which some of you or most of you would have also had opportunity to join in. In undertaking these activities and the consultations process, including numerous other outreach events, the project did not only produce the roadmaps, but presented valuable opportunities to discuss and extensively consult regionally and allowed stakeholders to work towards a consensus on options and possible uh, pathways for how to coordinate. Uh, coordination uh, uh, being cited as one of the potential barriers to, um, to getting into uh, the thick of the action. And, um, and indeed, um, uh, in launching this roadmaps today and, uh, and subsequently closing this project, uh, we look forward uh, and um, today we focus also on expectations and future imp implementation. As we heard from both A's and IEA and also the details from our panelists today on initiatives that are already ongoing to deploy solutions, the roadmaps provide a good starting point for further work. A single document for ASEAN as one of our panelists uh, have described it um, for member states to translate their um, EE programs for cooling and buildings and um, also um, uh, to, uh, to pursue initiatives in the uh, construction industry. We therefore hope to see the thorough dis dissemination of the roadmaps to uh, member states 
including to stakeholders beyond energy that will result in the roadmaps filtering through national and subnational governments and to become guiding documents to implement uh, their, their uh, roadmaps and cooling appliances and buildings. Um, colleagues at the ASEAN uh, Secretariat, in fact, are also work, starting work on an ASEAN Carbon Neutrality Action Plan uh, this year and energy's uh, contribution, including this um, uh, uh, energy efficiency for cooling in buildings will will be such a crucial uh, contribution uh, to this effort uh, to hit the ground uh, running. Uh, it's a it's a to us it's a low lying fruit. Um, we also hope that the work of the EES and CSSN in implementing the APAYEC, more especially in the design of initiatives. Um, to implement our annual milestones will help secure the long-term long impact of this project and that these roadmaps will be leaving documents to be evolved and adjusted by AMS with the help of uh, AES and IEA as we go along. Uh, we heard from, uh, we heard from uh, the experts from uh, the uh, um, member states and also the international organizations that it is very, very crucial to be able to, um, to adjust this to, uh, to uh, national and uh, local uh, uh, realities. Uh, the work to bring clean energy and um, energy efficiency to the region is a huge uh, uh, effort. And we always say at the ASEAN Secretariat that there is room for everyone to help. The roadmaps will become powerful reference, not only for ASEAN, but also for our work in, in cooperating with uh, uh, DPs and partners to pursue concrete projects and initiatives. There is nothing like a set of roadmaps in one document to help bring coherence to the potential in initiatives to embark, to embark on uh, in a sea of stakeholders and play players that are raring to work across the region. Some of our DPs and partners, in fact, um, we've invited them to also join today so that we may potentially um, uh, um, pursue work with them um, um, to, 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 uh, to make this uh, roadmap uh, uh, possible, rather the, the implementation, the achievement of this roadmap possible. Uh, so just very quickly, allow me uh, to, 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 uh, to uh, acknowledge uh, with the sort of raise a round of applause to, uh, to the uh, teams and the uh, major stakeholders that have made these uh, uh, roadmaps uh, possible. Uh, I think um, it's just fitting to acknowledge uh, uh, the, the teams uh, from IEA, Emily McWalter, Maxine Jordan, Senya, uh, Dr. Senya, of course, was uh, was one of our uh, panelists, Michael Opperman, with the uh, guidance of Melanie Slade and Brian Motherway, and of course the program coordination of Kiran Clark, from ACE Rio, Nelia, Kianda Bintang, and the leadership of uh, 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 Septia, who was also our moderator today, um, AADCP2's Catherine Corpus, and the, the 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 entire team led by uh, before by Adrian Gilbert and now Tim Smith, um, ASEX Energy and Minerals Division in Rawayudin. And the guidance and oversight from the uh, ENC subsector network uh, itself and the uh, and the member states, um, plus the the involvement of experts from a wide wide range of uh, international organizations, financial institutions, and universities. Um, um, I think I will not uh, go and uh, list them out, uh, but um, their their work is very uh, 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 well uh, acknowledged. And um, our deep gratitude to all who had contributed their knowledge, expertise, and experience, and valuable time in making the, the development of these roadmaps uh, successful. Um, we also thank those who have stayed with us today for this launch. We hope it has been an interesting, useful session for you, and that follow-on activities will flow from here. Regional roadmaps need implementation. So we look forward to supporting priorities for immediate follow-up, uh, including identifying coordination and lead implementing bodies that have been raised by the panelists as, as really needed, and the specific projects to achieve our targets under APEC phase two and the overall sustainability objectives of the ASEAN economic community. So with that, uh, thank you once again. Um, um, back to you, uh, Christina. Thank you very much, Ms. Mary. Okay, distinguished participants, ladies and gentlemen. Ten minutes. Before concluding this event, I highly recommend you to all of the distinguished participants to fill up the positive information form that we have already shared through the chat box. 
Your input and feedback will be invaluable to improve our future events. We thank you once again for your cooperation and support. Also, I would like to inform that the recording for this webinar will be available soon on our YouTube channel, SM Center for Energy. So please kindly subscribe. With this, I would like to thank to all of you again for this fruitful discussion, and I wish you all good health and look forward to seeing you in the next event. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.